All right, so today uh, I'll just give you all a brief introduction as to what CP3 is all about and how we'll start uh, with CP3 and what all uh, we'll do and how we should prepare for CP3. And generally, if you have heard about a CP3 paper from anyone, uh, they will always tell you that uh, some of you, some of them who might have not cleared CP3, they generally don't clear it by just a margin of you know five to six marks. And even if uh, those who clear CP3 are uh, generally clearing it with the margin of more like approximately five to six marks. So it is very difficult actually to score very good marks in CP3, like getting above 70 in CP3 is a very big thing. And get, getting above 75 is something which very few uh, students can uh, score above uh, 75 in CP3. Um, and also if you're appearing from IEI, uh, the passing marks generally is around 50 and for IFO it is generally around always 60. Sometimes they reduce it to 56 or 55 or 57 but that depends on the paper and also it is very subjective because it also depends on the uh, way the others, other students have attempted the paper right so generally it is around 60 marks so we will consider it to be a 60 marks and we will work accordingly so that at least we can minimum bare minimum we can score above uh, 60 like right? that is our major aim over here so cp3 is communication practice in this paper you don't actually have to you know sit down and memorize anything or it is not a paper where you have a defined syllabus it is a paper where you will get you can get anything actually it can be related to any of the topics uh, which you have studied so far in other uh, cmcs or ct series or it can be a topic which is completely uh, not related to actuarial uh, background, maybe not related to insurance, maybe not related to pensions. It can be completely a new uh, domain. Uh, here the major thing and the main, main important thing over here is to present your answer and to write your answer in such a way that it is very, very understandable. At the same time, it, uh, it actually... Um, covers all the objectives of the given question paper. So there is a pattern in which we will study CP3 because see, uh, it's not about studying a lot. It is about studying smartly in CP3 because then only we will be able to clear it and with that good margin that we have, right? So that is very important. Now here, uh, I'll just, uh, just explain you the pattern of how CP3 examination is conducted. So CP3 exam uh, prior to the, so this is uh, for IFOA. For IFO and IEI, the patterns are a little different. So for IFO, what happens is that you get a scenario material or advanced scenario uh, three days, three working days prior to your exam. So for example, if your exam is on Wednesday, you will get the scenario material on a Friday, right? So generally that is uh, how IFO does three working days. It calculates three working days and it gives you an advanced scenario. Now this advanced scenario which you are getting contains any, it can be a case study on any topic, right? It can be climate change like recently uh, CP3 paper they gave climate change. It can be related to cryptocurrencies which came along back maybe two, three years ago. It can be uh, related to uh, maybe... Uh, it can be related to a GLM model like they gave GLM model in 2020. So it can be anything, any model, any case study which they will give you in the uh, scenario material. Might so happen that along with that they might give you a spreadsheet which is very unlikely they, uh, they have just given spreadsheets in one or two exams. Within that spreadsheet, you don't have to perform any calculations or as such. They will give you the spreadsheet readily made. You might be making some graphs. Other than that, you don't have to perform any such big calculation. So this scenario that we are getting three days prior to our exam, it's, it is uh, is basically where we have to read the entire scenario, understand the entire case study properly, and we don't have to actually do any additional research. For example, recently in the recent paper, if I say, uh, they gave a material on climate change, wherein, uh, you know, just to, uh, just, uh, uh, describing it briefly, uh, they mentioned about different investments and investments, uh, climate conscious investments. So basically uh, making those investments wherein uh, it is not impacting the climate in a particular manner. For example, not investing in oil or gas. Instead, investing in solar uh, energy, uh, new, uh, maybe 
wind energy and so on so instead investing in these nuclear or uh, these uh, natural uh, resources rather than investing in the coal and all those things so this is one just one underlining concept now here they might be using some difficult words here suppose if it's a if it's a motor insurance for example a case study on a motor insurance then if you are actually working in this particular domain you might also have some preconceived notions right so here what they tell you in uh, cp3 is that forget about all the preconceived notions that you have because whatever is given in the advanced scenario you might think that it is wrong but you have to consider it to be correct and you have to work on it accordingly so what we have to do in those 3 days is that we have to go through the advanced material that we have again and again understand all the lines properly uh, if there are some important difficult words then to underline those words interpret those words in our own words so uh, these uh, maybe these difficult words are generally known as jargons for example in cp3 the most important aspect is communication in a easier language and it depends on the audience you are communicating so what happens is that when we get the scenario material 3 days before the exam we have to study this and during the exam on the day of the exam when the exam when you are getting the exam paper so exam paper will tell you as to whom you are communicating now this communication can be to anyone it can be to a, a director it can be to a manager it can be to your colleague it can be to someone who is joining your company recently at, at a junior level it can be to general public it can be to a policy holder it can be to shareholders it can be to trustees uh, anyone so it can be to anyone it can be maybe a press release so you are actually writing a paper which has to be released in press uh so it can be anything the audience you will get to know about the audience on the day of the exam that is at the point of the exam in the exam paper and uh, they will also build up on the advanced scenario so for example the advanced scenario for ifo is generally around 5 to 6 pages and then what they'll do is build up on this advanced scenario maybe one or two pages more and they'll give you the question so that is how the cp3 exam works in case of ifo in case of iei you will get the advanced material and the question paper together at the time of the examination so here in ifo it is a 3 hours uh, exam they recently increased 5 minutes to so 3 hours 5 minutes exam and in case of iei i think it's around 3 hours or 3 hours 30 minutes i'm not pretty sure recently but yes it is 3 hours 30 minutes around that right so it is almost the same just the only difference is that in case of iia they give the advanced material at the point of exam itself they will not give you the advanced material prior to the uh, exam now this is no big disadvantage for those who are appearing from iia it's not a very big disadvantage because see uh, the advanced material which the iia gives is approx is uh, generally very very uh, less maybe two pages around sometimes like three pages not more than that in case of ifo it's a big case study that they give around in five to six pages so that's the difference actually yes uh, in iia you have to be a little faster because you have to process the case study at that point of exam time only so that is one difference other than that there is no other difference between the two papers that is one thing second thing the uh, Uh, let's talk about the exam paper how the exam paper is all about so there are two questions which you will get the first question will be of 90 marks 90 90 marks that will be the main part of the entire question paper which will consist of the communication so you might be told to write a letter or you might be told to write a email or a press release or a meeting paper or a memo so it can be anything and then the second question is of 10 marks which can have 2 to 3 uh, to 4 parts sub parts it will be of 2 marks approximately 4 marks around so total in total it's of 10 marks and we call this as reflective questions so what are these reflective questions it's basically in the 90 marks section whatever you have written and what all words you have used how you have presented your numerical data all these different questions will be asked in your 10 marks question as to why you used these words why you included a particular information in your communication why did you present it in a particular manner so all these things reflective questions will be asked in the 10 mark now what i have seen generally is that these this 10 mark a uh, portion in the reflective question is something which most of the students ignore and they keep it for the last moment or they just don't prepare for it and at the last moment like when they are appearing for the paper they might uh, just write 
any blindly they might just write any uh, anything any anything which is coming their mind and you will not actually score very good marks and you may end up scoring just maybe five to six marks or four marks in that 10 mark question whereas in that 10 mark question you can easily score seven to eight marks which is something i see only one or two percent of the students can actually score that seven to eight marks rest of them all score below uh, seven marks or maybe they are scoring five marks four marks because they always ignore that 10 marks question so that is one thing which we don't have to do which we'll work from day one itself and when we talk about communication so how communication is related firstly whatever the case study is given to you don't have to perform any kind of research other than what is given to you in the advanced material you don't have to do carry out any of your own research uh, or any of your own analysis no nothing you just have to read what they have given derive conclusions out of that given material itself nothing else you have to prepare right so it's not about uh, technical uh, knowledge or maybe it's not about uh, you know uh, memorizing something it's all about communicating that case study whichever whatever is given to you in a easier language for example if a policy holder if there is an entire pricing uh, strategy given to you as to how a particular product is priced right everything is given to you maybe it's a glm they are following and everything different factors like bmi persons uh, income level all these things are given now you actually have to explain this to a policy holder now a policy holder can be anyone right so a policy holder can be from a complete non technical background someone who is not very educated someone who might not even understand words like mortality right so these words are considered to be jargons these technical words actual terms that we use like mortality like maybe prudence concept or maybe uh, uh, volatility uh, all these different words that we have depreciation or you all can come up with any these uh, words that we consider it to be very very common but actually these are the words which are considered to be jargons because these are technical words which cannot be understood by a layman or someone who is not from the actual background right so these or maybe correlation sometimes diversification even these are considered to be jargons right so it is very very important to identify these jargons because most of the times what happens is that we overlook these easier terms we think that this is a very very simple word anyone can understand but actually it's not a uh, easy word it's just something which is difficult and cannot be understood by a layman right so this is how we have to identify those jargons also sometimes uh, you you have certain points which you have to explain it to someone who is a layman in a very very easier language for example if i tell you just a very quick example like a company or a fund manager that there are two different fund managers active and passive so for example i tell you the passive passive fund manager is the one who is tracking the index but as the active fund manager manager is someone who is actually investing in different uh, shares or different assets and also uh, using the rule of diversification so this is very easily understood by us but if you go and explain this to someone who is not at all from the finance background they will not understand anything what i said right so you have to make this understand to someone who is not from the technical background who does not have your knowledge for example someone who is coming from sales department they might not they are actually at a very very high post they may be manager at, in a particular department but still they will not be able to understand what all jargons we are using right so it is very important in this paper that we communicate it to uh, someone who is from non technical background in a very very easier term so all these different terminologies different jargons now it will also depend on the audience we are communicating to for example if i am communicating to general public right and then again if i am communicating to my colleague or maybe to my uh, someone who is my junior who has recently joined the actuarial team so that person does not have any knowledge obviously or any prior uh, not knowledge any prior experience work experience so but still you can easily use use words like diversification volatility with that particular person who has joined your company recently because that person has actually studied different papers right but here when we talk for a general public they will never understand 
or not all of them will understand these terminologies even when we talk about trustees so trustees are a people who come from diverse backgrounds right they are the ones who invest in your company so they come from different uh, or trustees or sponsors so they come from different background different they don't have the exact knowledge of all the terminologies so again we we'll not be able to use all these terms with them so it depends and if you are communicating to a manager then you can easily use all these terms so it depends as to whom you are communicating to from what background that person is coming from what education level that person has accordingly we will draft our communication right so it will differ from people to people and what we'll do in class is we'll try to cover all these different audiences that we can have so far and we'll discuss in class as to what can be a jargon for a particular person and how to reframe particular lines particular objectives so that we are able to communicate a particular thing in a very nice manner now the another thing which is very important is the objectives now what are these objectives when we talk about so for example uh, when you get the uh, question paper which is on the day of the exam in that question paper you will have so there is an audience for example a policy holder is our audience now that policy holder has a few concerns the concerns are maybe uh, my premium is very high uh, i have been quoted a premium of maybe 1000 rupees but i am being charged 1500 every month what is the reason then uh, the uh, the another uh, question might be or the another uh, problem might be that i uh, am not getting any surrender value when i am surrendering my term assurance policy why is this happening when i was told that i will uh, be benefiting from this particular policy i have paid premiums for 6 long years but now when i want to surrender my policy i am not getting any surrender value now that person so you cannot directly write to that person that it was mentioned in the terms that you will not get the surrender value you actually have to sit down and explain that why we cannot give you the surrender value and you also at the same time will try to keep the person's business because see uh, that person's uh, business with you right because uh, you you cannot uh, you cannot lose your business at this moment so you have to also be very very polite at the same time uh, what do we say is uh, we don't have to apologize for everything that we have not done so all these things you have to keep you don't you cannot use very emotive terms or emo emotive terminologies like you are absolutely wrong or for example uh, for example if you are communicating to a particular client or a policy holder whose bmi is very high for example so you cannot directly tell that person that because your weight is very high your bmi is very high this is a very very bad way of expressing right so we have to use make, make correct use of these words draft it properly so that they don't feel bad when they read the audience and they also understand that what are they uh, what is the situation right so these can be different objectives for example the person is asking why the premium is high the person is asking why uh, i am not getting the surrender value so all these are the objectives now what will happen is that for example the policy holder is writing my company a letter and within that letter they are you know mentioning these issues so we have to actually point out what are the different objectives or what are the different things that we have to focus on as i mentioned that in the scenario material it will be a 5 6 page scenario material and the question paper again will build up on the scenario maybe one or two pages and then give you the question so you have a lot of content with you right you cannot put down all these content in your answer script your answer should be limited maybe it should be within 900 words so the word limit will be given nowadays i ifoa and i are generally not mentioning any word limit so what we do is we keep it somewhere around 850 to 950 not more than that so you actually have to uh, cut down a lot of information and just keep those information which are required so another thing which is very very important after identifying objectives is to filter out information so once you have identified okay there are three basic objectives i have to explain the person why the premium is high. i have to explain why uh, there is no surrender value i have to explain regarding bmi for example and now i will cut down or filter out these informations what is not required and then what is required and only put those particular information so there should not be overburdening of information in cp3 so firstly identify the objectives very 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 important 
once you have actually uh, identified objectives and in CP3 you will not get more than three to four objectives. Some, sometimes there are just two objectives. Sometimes we have three, sometimes maximum of four objectives, not more than that. So once you have identified those underlining objectives in the paper, the next step is to uh, again um, filter out the information. So for the objective one, which is why my premium is high, I will have to get those information from the scenario material, which is relevant to this particular objective, which is directly relevant to this particular objective. So I will ignore everything and just write those things, those information in my paper, because I don't want to overburden the policy holder with a lot of information, right? As it is, the person is not very much, um, educated to an understand uh, about this or maybe the person is very very well educated but not in the actual domain so they may not understand ma many terminologies right so this is how we first identify objectives the second is to filter out information once you have filtered out the information the next is obviously sentence structure sentence construction so here uh, again it will come up with practice and we'll be as we'll be discussing in our coming classes as to how at the same time you have to keep the sentences short giving out all the information which is necessary absolute necessary and required and also keeping it simple so that the audience can understand so these two to three things should be in mind while drafting these uh, sentences or while drafting the communication now the first time when you sit down and actually draft a cp3 paper you will not be able to complete the paper in the first go itself or if even if you complete the paper you may not obviously be very good at it so you will actually have to practice a lot of cp3 past papers in order to build up that level of communication right because there are some terminologies there are some sentences there are some ways in which you construct a sentence is very very common we will follow those methods only so that at least we can get our full marks in some places because in scoring in the content portion is very difficult for CP3. So there are few places I will which I will guide you all which in which you can easily score full marks like the marks in your format. So when you draft the entire format of the communication, you can easily score full marks in that. Uh, then there are some places, for example, jargons then t uh, different charts uh, that you construct or different tables that you construct. You can easily score full marks in these places. But when we talk about the content, like what you are actually putting in, in your communication, when you are writing your CP3 paper, that portion is somewhere which I believe is very difficult to score. So we will focus on things which we can, where we can actually score 100%, uh, 100% like where we can actually score full marks. And then slowly we will build on the areas which are difficult to score on so that at least we have this particular uh, section full and we are actually able to clear our paper, right? That is our first aim. Then comes scoring high marks, right? So that is there. Then uh, cut the waffle. Basically what we are trying to say over here is uh, just keep your sentences short. Don't write something which is not necessary or is irrelevant, which is not at all required. For example, uh, you will never tell a policy holder that our profit margin is 10%. So we are charging you a higher premium. Will you tell this to a policy holder? No. But the same thing if you are writing to a manager, your company's manager, you might include these things that, okay, we are aiming for a profit margin of 10% and so that is why we are keeping such a high premium, whatever the reason is, whatever the sentences are. So here you have to understand what is relevant to that particular audience and what is overburdening of information. So we don't have to overburden with information and at the same time we have to also distinguish between different audiences so that we can frame our sentences and write only those information which is complete necessary. Right? So that that is what it means by removing unnecessary lines over here. Right? Then we have save the time by using short addresses for example here uh, so this is something which we'll actually discuss moving ahead um, now it is very important to understand that uh, as i've also already discussed about this that we actually you know uh, use a lot of actual words 
terminologies which we just use like that we don't consider it to be any jargon for example when i say volatility when i say diversification you might consider it to be very very simple but if you have any friend who is not at all in the finance domain who is not at all in the actuarial domain you just go and talk to that person using these terminologies they will not understand and so it's a very very and if they are not very much into reading newspapers or very much into reading finance news they will never understand these words right even you know that so uh, what is how to clear cp3 since you all have taken up classes so the one thing which we'll do in our coming classes is, is that we'll discuss a lot so when you are suppose tanish is writing a paper and he is sharing his paper with us so it is not only me who will check the paper and uh, i will guide him personally no we'll discuss his paper in the class so that everyone can understand where he is going wrong so that we don't use the same thing in our exam right so we don't make the same mistake in our exam that is one thing very very important second thing when you see others paper and you try to give a judgment on that paper your cp3 communication will improve you will be able to understand as to where you all cannot make mistakes right where because you have already seen his mistakes so you will avoid making those in your paper right that is very 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 important and the next thing is to get a good feedback because see in cp3 the more feedback you get about your paper the better it is and when i say more feedback you cannot just go and ask anyone for feedback it should be someone who has actually a uh, good knowledge of cp3 or what else you can do is suppose if you are communicating to a policy holder then you can show this paper to your friend who is not from actuarial background if your friend is understanding the entire paper then the policy holder can also understand that is one thing that you can do in cp3 but since we all are here so we all will discuss in class that is very very important that you all attend my live cp3 classes it's very very important because we do a lot of discussions and it is a very interesting uh, discussion that we do so it is very important to understand this actuarial languages these actuarial words are actually jargons for some people and we cannot use them directly right so now what is the approach to produce this uh, written paper now it is very important to understand as i mentioned what is the objective of the audience second to filter out information which is not required third to identify jargons and to identify those terms which are actually difficult and to frame the uh, entire paper in mind once you have identified objectives once you have done these things now the next step is always to identify as to how will you frame your paper what should i write my introduction section what should i give in my first section in my second section third section in my summary how should i present the graphs in the particular format should i use bar charts should i use column charts should i use line chart should i use scatter plot very very important how should i produce my tables right so even you have marks on these so i will moving forward i will explain in my classes that what and your marks uh, are of these charts and tables are approximately 5 to 6 marks you get on these and you can easily score full 5 to 6 marks how i will guide you when we move forward so what all charts we can use what all information we can put in our paper how to represent certain uh, you know numbers figures for example if my bmi is coming as 52.6 for example you cannot directly write 52.6 is your bmi so how to round off your figures that those small things are very very important right now uh, so here uh, again uh, i have just taken a brief example so there is an just let's skip this part because it's a very very uh, uh, lame kind of an example which i have taken and i have already given you an example about the policy hold so that is there then uh, making the point accurately we have discussed this view point we have also discussed this view point thing is that when you are talking to a policy hold you cannot talk about that my profit margin is 10% that is why your premium is so, so high but when you are talking to a manager you can mention these points right you can easily mention that okay the profit margin is so and so the reserve is so and so uh, the uh, sponsors the aims of the shareholders or maybe the directors is so and so so that is why we are keeping the premium as this much so your viewpoint should always be crystal clear as to whom you are referring to 
if you are referring to a policy holder if you, you will refer to in uh, him in such a way way so that the person is not disrespected and the person also tries to keep their business with you they don't you know move their business to someone else to your competitor at the same time when you are uh, you know uh, communicating to your manager or your director you have to be very careful as to what all information to share here you can actually share most of the informations which is uh, you know internal to the company but how to share those communication that is again very important so viewpoint the company's point of view or the policy holders point of view is very important style and tone is very important like you cannot say that since you are a smoker your mortality rate is high you are likely to die earlier you cannot say this directly right to a policy holder you will have to frame it in a particular manner that we uh, you know divide a policy holders into smoker and non smokers so people who are smokers are generally considered to be the people who have a higher death rate right and so uh, the premiums we charge and these are considered to be the uh, policy holders who are at a higher risk so we charge them a higher premium as compared to non smokers this is how you will frame it instead of directly pointing it out that you are a smoker and you are your mortality is high so instead of pointing directly this is how you will actually frame the entire thing so the style and the tone should be very good it should be friendly not very friendly not very emotive it should be formal and uh, suppose if there is a new joiny in your company then there should be a welcoming tone what is a welcoming tone so you will firstly write in your introduction that uh, we are glad to welcome i am glad to welcome you in our uh, company and joining my team so you have to be welcoming right if it's a policy holder who is really upset with your policy then you will write explain the entire thing and at the end you will you can mention that we hope we really hope that you keep your business with us in future so all these you are important to us so that is that is how we can actually frame the style and the tone of the paper should be very very proper right then we have uh, as i mentioned the reflective questions which is a 10 marker question that we have so 90 marks once it is done you have those 10 marker questions so you have 3 to 4 parts for that now here they might ask you questions like what all terminologies did you use right what all jargons did you did not use so you can mention the jargons you did not use they might ask you what was the structure of your paper how did you structure your paper what was the style and tone uh what all graphs or graphical representation or numerical presentation you used and why did you prefer using those so all these are the questions they ask you trust me this is something which is not easy to write because i have seen that we write any anything any we just write anything in these questions and we get just 4 to 5 marks so if you want to actually score 7 marks or 8 marks in this 10 marks question then you have to use proper terms i have entire you know um, document ready uh, which you can refer where you can actually refer i have lot of uh, these reflective questions and answers to these reflective questions so that you all can refer to it you all can read it before the exam so that you have those things those certain terms are very very important to keep in mind right and we'll discuss them in class as well so for example when we say different graphs different charts that you use why did you use that so you can write that within my pie chart i used a pie chart why so that i can show the different proportions invested in different assets and within the chart i use it used percentages for example 50% invested in equity or uh, 20% invested in bonds and so on and outside the chart in my words when i was explaining the chart i used pounds for example 50000 dollars invested in uh, equity so i have used i have added variety to my paper i have used both the percentages and the pounds so i have added a variety so these key things these important words are very important when we answer these kind of questions now you have to make justification for the choices while drafting for example you have to keep it necessary you have to keep it very simplified you have to remove any unnecessary level of detail the audience is not particularly technical so you will and will not understand all the things that you are writing so you have to keep in mind that particular aspect so these things are very very important now here lastly i have laid down the entire marking distribution 
this might have changed a little uh, which we which we will actually change when we uh, move forward in our further classes uh, so here if you see this is the entire marking breakdown i'll just uh, share this Right, it's visible. All right. So here, um, all right. So here, proper range of words. So generally, in your communication, in your in the question, they will mention that write your communication, write your letter within nine hundred words. If it is nine hundred words, then you should keep your word limit between nine eight seventy five to nine twenty five. If the word limit is 900, that does not mean that you will create, you will write a, a particular communication which will be of 600 or 700 words. Still, your marks will be deducted. You have to write a proper range of words, maybe 875 to 925 or so. Not more than this or not less than this because otherwise your marks will be deducted. Then you have, and this is a five mark direct. Uh, five marks which you can easily score now recently in last two three terms what they are doing is they are removing this first portion so they have removed the word limit they are not mentioning the word limit directly so if they are not mentioning any word limit i generally say that we should keep it within 850 to 950 words then the the entire communication should be properly addressed it should have a suitable title address date whom you are referring to, what on what date you are writing a proper title, all these things will give you three marks. So we'll discuss as to what can be the proper title, what is the what are what are the main aspects of a particular format, what we have to include in the address, what we have to include in the title, and all those things. Again, something which you can directly score three on three. Then, but you obviously have to practice. You cannot just sit, go and score. I have seen students scoring one mark or zero in this three marks. Uh, portion then it is planning and presentation again uh, so there are many aspects to this particular part wherein it is 12 marks generally again I have seen uh, getting uh, approximately 9 or 10 marks within this 12 marks is simple you can score but when I say simple that simple will come with practice then once you have written six seven papers once you have attended all the live classes then it becomes easier to score around 9 to 10 marks or 11 marks in this 12 mark portion then again charts uh, which I was referring to earlier 5 marks again simple to score 5 marks but again you have to keep many many things in mind when constructing these different charts. Overall language is 7 marks when, when, when they say overall language it is uh, not any you cannot make any grammatical mistakes. So in CP3 it is very important to uh, see if there are any grammatical mistakes or spelling mistakes. What is the tone of your entire communication? All these things are important. Now, again, a benefit uh, to, to students who are appearing from IFOA. You all get the word file. So you all basically can construct a word file. And in word file, we have those proof reading. Wherein uh, you all can check for spelling mistake, mistakes. You all can check for grammatical mistakes. But in case of IEI, since the exam is happening online uh, from home, your exam happens on a text editor so for so that text editor cannot uh, give you the wrong uh, spelling or wrong grammatical mistakes that you have any grammatical mistakes that you have committed so in case of IEI you have to be more careful once they uh, make it physical uh, exam I think they will shift again to MS Word then it's not an issue but now in the July attempt they are actually keeping it online so it will be text editor and there is no way in which you all can uh, actually, you know, um, understand your grammatical or uh, spelling mistakes. So you have to be very, very careful from IEI. IFO, as it is, you get those proofreading. But still, again, since you all know that when we are using MS Word, uh, generally the language is US language. So again, you have to be a little careful there about the uh, spelling mistakes and uh, grammatical mistakes that will come uh, when we will talk about this. Then is absence of jargon, 4 marks. Again, very easy to score 4 on 4 considering that you actually find out the jargons. For example, you are unknowingly using any particular jargon in your, uh, you know, paper. You end up using any jargon, you will lose your marks over here. Then we have don't use superfluous accuracy of numbers. Again, suppose if a particular fund va value after 10 years has turned to be $17,216.33 million, for example. 
then you don't have to be very accurate you can just mention 17400 that's it you don't have to give it till the last pound right so that is again superfluous accuracy we'll come to it when we'll talk so maybe sometimes we just mention 10000 instead of 10900 or 10600 something directly 11000 so all these things when we'll come to it's very simple again you can score 3 on 3 over here then we have irrelevant points so irrelevant point is of 3 marks somewhere which i something which i believe very difficult to score why we end up writing one or two or more irrelevant points which is not required by the audience they don't ask for it even it does not fulfill any of their objectives if it is not fulfilling any of their objectives then it is completely um irrelevant right next we have uh next we have uh, no grammatical error spelling punctuation again of 3 marks uh, offer for help uh, mentioned at the end this is one mark easily you can score one on one uh generally at the end of your communication we mention this particular line which we'll discuss later on and then we have the content which is of 39 marks as i mentioned so this 39 marks is the portion which is actually difficult to score generally i have seen students scoring 24 22 23 or even you know around 14 15 so if you are actually scoring so low out of these 39 marks you are actually losing a major chunk of your 20 marks or maybe 15 to 20 marks over here so if you are losing your 15 to 20 marks over here it is it becomes equally important that you score full marks in this portion so that at least you are able to clear your exam and trust me out of this 39 marks there are very 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 few people who score above 30 very very few people it is very difficult to score marks in the content portion and that is why we mainly focus on this and then we focus on this portion why because whatever you write it is very difficult to score above uh, 30 marks here but still we will make it a point that at least we score above 26 or 27 then we have meeting objectives now this is of 5 marks recently in the past two three papers they have increased this 5 marks to 7 or 8 marks uh, generally i think it's 8 marks around 8 marks they have changed it to so here they will they will see whether you are actually able to meet the objective of the audience so if the audience has 3 to 4 objectives whether you are completely able to meet those 8 objectives right that is very very important that you are not skipping any point or you are completely able to meet their objectives then we have the 10 mark reflective question as i was discussing earlier again something where we will aim to score around 7 8 mark so this is how you know uh, we have i have make, made this entire marking distribution i will share it with you all but now it is obviously uh, difficult to you know um, relate to these marking distribution moving forward you all can easily relate to this and you will not get this everywhere so i will uh, share this with you all later on uh, but again i'll share it once we start moving ahead with the papers that we'll discuss so that is again very very uh, important and a uh, gist of the entire cp3 paper you don't have to actually sit down every day for 3 hours and study no but whenever you sit down and study it should be very very important that you are fully concentrated and i will give you targets that what all you have to do and whatever i give you please try to complete that before the next weekend so that we can sit down and discuss in the live class in the live class mostly we'll be having a lot of discussions rather than me typing and you just seeing because it does not make any sense that i'm typing the uh, entire communication and you are just sitting down and watching what i'm doing that does not make much of a sense right so i will uh, give you some of the videos uh, which you have to watch during the week and then at the end of the week we'll have a class again after some just maybe some of the videos then we'll only move to discussing past papers where i will give you a lot of past papers to solve so maybe during a week i've given you one past paper to solve please solve that paper and so that we can come down in class and discuss so i will try to discuss all your papers in class so that all your uh, papers are uh, you all are getting a good feedback as to what you all are writing so that is again very very important that you all at least follow so in in the entire week if even if you're taking out maybe 5 hours or 6 hours it's more than enough but make sure that you attend the live classes that we have on the sunday 
that is very very important in order to clear and the last thing which i will just like to share with you all is that until and unless you are sitting down and writing and typing down your communication no way you can clear the cp3 exam so you actually have to make a point that you sit down and type your communication because i've seen many people many people what they do is they just read the answers they read the question they read the summary, uh, scenario material in their mind they are just making up points or maybe the sentence constructions they have thought about all the things over here but they are not sitting down and typing so they are very much confident that that since i have thought in my head i will be able to produce it in the exam when but, but when they actually sit for the exam and they sit to type it will never come in the first go so it will take some time minimum 2 to 3 papers it will take for you to be very con to build some confidence and then again 4 to 5 papers to uh, have that clear concept as to where you can score marks where you cannot sc where you cannot score many much of a marks and that is how we actually have to minimum practice 10 papers then i think it is a very good deal that we have right so very very important that you all sit down and write those who are not typing down their answers you cannot clear the paper that is all about cp3 if you all have any further questions you all can ask uh, and from coming uh, weekend i will guide you as to how you have to proceed so here today what i'll do is i will guide you uh, what all things you have to cover and then from this coming sunday uh, which is next sunday we'll start with our discussions so anything which you uh, what you all have to mention uh, or anything which you all have to ask any question uh tanish uh, what uh, so uh, excel files are not given how to construct charts so here since the excel file is not given to you data is given to you in your pdf you type down that data in the excel and you produce the charts and you paste it copy paste it in your uh, ms word in case of iei you don't have to produce any charts because they just use the text editor you are not allowed to open excel excel files so in case of iei no charts but yes you can construct tables uh, how you construct tables in the text editor i will come to it in my classes in case of ifo you can easily open an excel file type down your data construct a chart and paste it in your ms word easily we can do that and we have to do that only in case of ifo ii no charts is required uh last two slides actually last two slides is uh nothing we'll not be able to understand this now i'm not going through the last two slides anything else um so all right so that is it for cp3 introduction what i'll do is i will just uh, share uh, what you all have to do for this week make sure please you do it uh, it will just take you 5 6 hours so that in the coming class we can you all can actually join the live classes and we can have a good discussion right anything uh, you anything else all right ayushi arhan thank you so much for joining and uh, then we'll meet on the coming sunday and today i'll let you all know that as to what you all have to cover for this week right thank you so much.